the GI surveillance module and the BSI module and the UTI module. What we will be discussing today is two very different modules. One is the VAC module. Um, just to give a heads up, you many of you might be knowing that um, CDC has uh, stopped surveillance for ventilator associate, associated pneumonia because of problems with definitions, although they have been uh, doing VAP surveillance for almost 20 years before it was, you know, decided that um, the, the diagnosis of VAP starts with uh, imaging, you know, and that is where the problem lies that uh, there is a lot of discrepancy in imaging and the interpretation and also that there are different definitions now being used, which are known as ventilator associated complications which can be events and probable VAP and IVAP. So, uh, because we talk about India-specific definitions, when we talk about device-associated infections or hospital-acquired infections, we had this discussion with ICMR that ventilator-associated pneumonia is something that we cannot ignore because Ultimately, VAP is one of the most common causes of morbidity and mortality in India and elsewhere also in ICUs. And uh, the IVAC and PVAP and ventilator associated event is something which at a network level is very difficult to do because as it is, you would have seen that surveillance for BSI and UTI itself is very, very labor intensive. It requires a very dedicated staff. It requires perseverance and continuous and sustained efforts at local institutional levels. To do the same for ventilator associated events uh, would be even more difficult. So two years back, we actually took uh, some of the definitions for VAP, uh, obviously taken from the original CDC's NHSN definitions, but modified according to what some of the hospitals in India are doing, because ultimately most hospitals uh, who are doing surveillance are also doing surveillance for VAP based on some definitions. So again, as for BSI and UTI, where we had sat down together and made a country specific protocol, uh, we at AIMS along with ICMR and a couple of hospitals in India made a definition for VAP, which is adapted from the original CDC's NHSN definition, but modified according to what couple of Indian hospitals are doing. So this will be a short session because most of the definitions you would be knowing, I'll just, um, what you have to really focus on is that we have made a modified version and as for the BSI and UTI, we have put more emphasis on microbiology. You would see that the VAB definition, uh, which is there currently in the CDC's NHSN puts microbiological diagnosis or detection as an optional um, category. But herein, because we have the micro capacity, we are leveraging the ICMR and NCDC's microbiology capacity. We have modified the definition to keep microbiology culture as um, one of the essential criteria. Uh, following this session will be a session on surgical site infection by Dr. Daniel van der Ende from CDC. And that will also talk about a modified definition for surveillance for uh, surgical site infection, and he will elaborate on why we have modified. So most of the modifications have been done so that surveillance becomes uh, easier, country specific, and something which is doable, even at district hospital levels, if you want to do that. So again, uh, surgical site infection is something which is often ignored. It is difficult because it requires long-term follow-up of patients, and that is why, again, we came out with uh, a definition and a particular surgery that is cesarean section, which is very important from maternal and child health perspectives, the priority of government of India, and also because it's a priority for all of us. So I'll just take uh, maybe a half an hour for the surveillance for VAP, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Daniel for his session on surgical site infection. So the objectives of this session will be uh, you will be able to describe key terms and case definitions which are used in VAP surveillance. So uh, just to give a heads up, uh, almost 11 hospitals in our network are already working on this VAP surveillance. So it's also a kind of validation of what, whether this VAP surveillance definition that we have made is doable and 
uh, I understand that at some of the district hospitals, uh, ventilators are not available. So this can be an optional thing. It's not necessary that uh, those hospitals who do not have ventilators in the ICUs, uh, obviously this uh, protocol will not be applicable to them. So you'll be dis able to describe key terms and case definition, complete the VAP infection and denominator reporting form, Conduct basic analysis of VAP surveillance data and correctly apply case definitions to identify VAP cases. So coming to the case definitions and the protocol. Now, what is a ventilator? For this surveillance, ventilator is defined as any device which is used to support, assist or control respiration. This is inclusive of the weaning period through the application of positive pressure to the airway when delivered via an artificial airway, especially an oral or nasal endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. Please note that ventilation and lung expansion devices that deliver positive pressure to the airway, for example, CPAP, BiPAP, bilevel, IPPB, and PEEP via non-invasive means like nasal prongs, nasal mask, full face mask, and total mask are not considered ventilators unless positive pressure is delivered via an artificial airway, which is, as I have said, an oral or nasal endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. So for VAP surveillance, as I mentioned, this VAP surveillance, which we are proposing to the network is focusing on laboratory confirmed VAP. So it is microbiology driven. So all the uh, facilities who are participating in this surveillance must have labs that are able to perform respiratory sample cultures and blood cultures. The hospital microbiology laboratories should be able to identify pathogens to the species level as is true, as was true for DSI and UTI. So coming to the first key term, we talked about window period yesterday in all the three modules. What is the window period? It is at seven day time frame in which all the criteria of the case definition must be met. It includes the date of the first positive case defining criteria and the three calendar days before and three after. So what is different from the BSI and UTI module is that for VAP surveillance, we are building a window period around the first positive case defining criteria, not necessarily against the first positive diagnostic test. So any positive case defining criteria and the three calendar days before and after is how we build up the window period for the ventilator associated pneumonia surveillance. So a seven day time frame in which all criteria of the case definition must be met. It includes the date of the first positive case defining criteria and the three calendar days before and three calendar days after. So how do you set up the window period? So consider this example. The microbiology lab falls you on 19th June to report that a bronchoalveolar lavage culture collected from a patient in the ICU on 17th June is growing Klebsiella pneumoniae. What is the window period of this potential VAP? You can put it in the chat box and I have taken a simpler example where I have taken a diagnostic test uh, as uh, a marker for setting a window period considering that we are taking microbiology as one of the defining criteria. So uh, 14 to 20. So here, correct. So the microbiology labs calls you on 19 June to report that a bile culture collected from a patient in the ICU on 17th is, collect, is growing Klebsiella pneumoniae. And we assume that it's 10 to the power 5 because that's the cutoff that we usually take. So uh, the window period will be three days before 17 and three days after 17. So it will be as all of you are saying, it is from 14th to 20th June. Now, considering what is the so, so window period, just to reiterate, why do we set up a window period? Because through window period, we come to know what is the date of event, which is the first date when we supposedly say that the event started because it is the date 
example, the first element used to meet the VAP case definition occurs for the first time within the window period. So, okay, just to recapitulate, we have a collection of uh, criteria to define a case as BSI, UTI, VAP. So, all these case defining elements must occur during the window period. And whatever happens first is used as the date of event. That means it is the date when the event started. So the date of event is the date when the first element used to meet the VAP case definition occurs for the first time within the window period. So now your surveillance staff goes to the ICU and you review the chart of the patient with Clepsidra pneumonia from this example. And you find that the patient had a chest X-ray with progressive infiltrates on 18th June. The patient develops a fever on 16th June. So now the patient meets the VAP case definition. Okay, I will come to the case definition, but the patient had an X-ray, bad X-ray, progressive infiltrates on 18th June and fever which developed on 16th June. Okay. So now what is the date of event for this probable VAP? 16. So most of you are saying it is 16. Okay. So in this patient, you had a positive microbiology sample, which was collected on 17 June, a progressive infiltrate, which was detected on 18 June and a fever on 16 June. So, of all the criteria which are required to coin a case as ventilator-associated pneumonia, the first thing that happened during the window period was on 16th June and that is why 16th June becomes the date of event. Supposing this patient also had fever on 15th June and 14th June, your date of event would have been 14th June because the first element which occurs for the first time in the window period. So, fever is the first element. If it was the patient was febrile from 14 June, during the window period, whatever happens first, first element which happens for the first time within the window period. So, that is how you determine the date of event. And as discussed yesterday, you need the date of event because you also need to set the event time frame. That when did this event start and when did that event end? Okay. So, once you have set the date of event, the next thing is whether that event is hospital acquired or it is present in admission. So, for hospital acquired infection, this date of event, which you said was 14th, 14 June, this date of event must be more than two calendar days after the date of hospital admission. Present in admission is when the date of event is less than or equal to two calendar days, which was discussed yesterday also. So, we have set the date of event. So, the next logical term that we come to is the event time frame. The surveillance protocol includes a rule to separate primary HEI events for the same patient because as I discussed yesterday, a patient may have multiple VAPs during the course of the stay. And therefore, we need to know when one event is ending, when you need to finish your case report form, document the outcomes and submit it to the database. That is by knowing when did the event start and what is the event time frame. So, the event time frame is a 14-day time frame during which a primary VAP is considered to be ongoing and no new VAPs can be reported for the patient. So, the date of event is the first day. And if you do or identify organisms from respiratory sample during this event time frame, it is to be added to the case report form for the initial VAP. So this is an example of a VAP with the date of event as 25th September. So supposing it was a ventilator associated pneumonia due to Klebsiella pneumonia with the date of event as 25th September. So as we know, the event is ongoing for 14 days. So, this event will continue from 25th September to 8th October. No new episode of VAP is to be reported during this period. So, now suppose you have a respiratory sample like a tracheal aspirate which grows acinetobacter bomini 10 to the power 5 on 30th September. 
this is not to be reported as a new VAP. This organism should be reported in the same case report form as a new organism. So it is one episode with multiple pathogens. So what are the inclusion criteria? Recall that the inclusion criteria have been developed to confirm that a VAP is healthcare associated and it is attributable to the ICU. So obviously, VAP will occur in the ICU because ventilated patients are in the ICU. So you have to report all the following into the database when the date of event does not occur within an ongoing event and the date of event must be more than two calendar days from ICU admission. So if all the criteria are fulfilled, you should report that. Otherwise, you need not report that case. So a case report form is completed for all VAPs that meet the inclusion criteria. This is not only for VAP, but for also BSIs and UTI. That everything that fits into your definition must be reported on a monthly basis. So what is ventilator associated pneumonia? It is a pneumonia where the patient is on mechanical ventilation for more than two calendar days on the date of event with the date of ventilator placement being day one and or the ventilator was in place on the date of event or the day before. So as for BSI and UTI, we have seen that um, you know, these devices are the risk factors for causing device associated infections. So whether it is a central line or a catheter or a ventilator, we assume that more than two calendar days of placement of a device is a risk factor for device associated infection. So to call it as VAP, the ventilator must be there for more than two calendar days on the date of event or it was removed just prior to the date of event or on the date, uh, date of event. So first thing is that it should be more than two calendar days, but it may have been removed on the day or a day before. And for reporting multiple episodes of VAP, the event time frame guidance from BSI UTI module needs to be followed. So as I said, the event time frame is for 14 days, so no new VAPs are to be reported if there is already an ongoing ventilator associated pneumonia. So now coming to the definition that we are using in this surveillance network for VAP, and this is the diagnostic algorithm. So there are three categories, three criteria. The first is one or more serial chest imaging test results with at least one of the following. Please pay attention to that. So you have a chest imaging X-ray with at least one of the following, a new and persistent or progressive and persistent infiltrate consolidation or cavitation. Now this is where you will really need your ICNs to focus upon because as microbiologists or as nurses, we, all, we find that we are not competent enough to read an X-ray, which is uh, especially in certain cases where, you know, consolidation and cavitation and emphysema and lung collapse may be very confusing. And that is where the problem lies in VAP that you really need um, uh, a very good rapport with either the radiologist or the intensivist to ascertain and to interpret a chest X-ray. And that is where the effort lies. All the others are very easy. They are objective parameters. But it is the chest X-ray, which is more subjective, and that is where you really need to discuss with your intensivist or radiologist. So the X-ray has to show a new and persistent or progressive and persistent infiltrate or consolidation or cavitation, any one of them, and of course, within the window period. So that is criteria one. The second is signs and symptoms. So amongst the signs and symptoms, the first one is a, sign, a symptom like any one of the following, either a fever, leukopenia or leukocytosis, and for adults more than 70 years old, altered mental status with no other recognized cause. So you have a chest X-ray, one of the findings, 
you have one of the following signs and symptoms from B.1. It is either fever or leukopenia or leukocytosis and for elderly is altered mental status. And one of the following, which is uh, an indication of an altered respiratory parameter or an altered characteristic in production of sputum. So any one of the following, which is new onset of purulent sputum, change in the character of sputum, increased respiratory secretions, increased requirement of suctioning, new onset or worsening cough, dyspnea, tachypnea, rails or long breath sounds or worsening gas exchange. So if you see the criteria that we have used, one is an x-ray finding, one is a clinical symptom and one is a parameter which suggests that there is worsening of gas exchanges or a change in the character of um, coughing or sputum. Okay, so one of the following uh, is to be fulfilled. And the final is the laboratory findings. Because as I said that we are leveraging the capacity of microbiology laboratory and that is why we have put a microbiology criteria as essential criteria. So at least one of the following, which is a positive quantitative or semi-quantitative culture from either bowel, endotracheal, aspirate or sputum. So we have put in a wide uh, range of either ors if you see the criteria. So either one of a positive quantitative or semi-quantitative culture or you have organisms identified from pleural fluid because you would agree that pleural fluid is absolutely sterile fluid. Any organism identified from it is to be taken as significant. Or if you are doing microscopy, if more than 5% of bile obtained cells contain intracellular bacteria, which is often difficult and often not used as a criteria because of the expertise needed in direct microscopy. Or you have a definitive diagnosis of fungal infection through histopathology or cultures. A definitive diagnosis of Bordetella, Legionella, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia or Viral Pneumonia through either molecular or serological tests. So you may have these criteria also, which is more applicable to have hospital acquired pneumonia rather than VAP. So um, it is often that we ignore this criteria because ventilator associated pneumonias are generally caused by the normal nosocomial pathogens like gram negatives. And for immunocompromised patients, isolation of the mat matching candida species from blood and sputum, endotracheal aspirate and bowel will also be taken as positive. So one of you asked about isolation of candida from blood and urine and, for, and from sputum. So I had clarified yesterday about the importance of blood, uh, candida from blood. Of course, you have to take that. For our surveillance, we are also taking candida from urine because that's one exception that we have made in our UTI surveillance case definition. But for VAP, it is only for immunocompromised patients where if you isolate a matching candida from blood and sputum or respiratory sample, it will also be taken as a positive uh, diagnostic criteria. If you isolate coagulase, then it is staph or enterococcus species or candida species uh, from otherwise immunocompetent patients. You have to ignore that. So the only exception is candida species from immunocompromised patients. Otherwise, coagulase negative staph and enterococcus have to be ignored. So for diagnosis of VAP, you should either have an X-ray finding plus one of the signs of symptoms, which is fever, leukocytosis, leukopenia. One of the signs of symptoms of worsening respiratory uh, parameters and a microbiology definition, uh, microbiology confirmation. So it is A plus B1 plus B2 plus C. If all these four occur within the window period, it is called as ventilator associated pneumonia and whatever happens first is taken as the date of event. Is that clear? Okay. So how do you find the case? As for other uh, device associated infections, we have to work with the microbiology lab, check the respiratory registers and the blood logbooks because 
blood is important in VAP also because a lot uh, many times there is secondary bacteremia and a matching culture is always helpful. Work with ICU staff because you need to talk to clinicians for the x-rays and that is one thing where you need extra effort and you have to query a variety of data sources like medical records, lab records and conversation with clinical staff. So about data entry, as for BSI and UTI, you will be filling a case report form for each identified case of VAP. And the denominator data here is the ventilator days and patient days. Okay, so you can have one denominator form which has four columns. Uh, one is the patient days, the other can be center line days, police catheter days and ventilator days. So what are the denominators that we use for calculation of VAM? We use the ventilator days and patient days. The denominator data should be collected at the same time every day for each participating ICU, including weekends and holidays. The denominator forms for collection of patient days and ventilator days, they are enclosed in the SOP, which will be provided to you. So what is a ventilator day? The denominator data is calculated, the ventilator day is calculated as the number of patients who are on ventilator in each ICU under surveillance each day. So when your surveillance staff goes to the ICU, you just have to see that how many patients are on bed and how many are on ventilator days. You just have to write the numbers and at the end of the month, you just add the numbers and that will give you the ventilator days. So surveillance staff should record the number of patients in the surveillance unit who have or who are on ventilator. Patient day is the total number of patients who are physically present in the surveillance unit and the patient day should be collected at the same time as the ventilator day. Now, how do you analyze the data? The most important, the globally accepted uh, uh, trait, uh, how, how actually you define or how you publish or how you project your rate is the ventilator associated pneumonia rate. So the VAP rate is the number of VAP episodes per thousand ventilator days. Okay, so you divide the number of VAPs by the number of ventilator day and multiply by 1000. So VAP rate is number of ventilator associated pneumonias divided by number of ventilator days into 1000. And the second criteria is device utilization ratio. So like for BSI and UTI, the presence of device is the risk factor for device associated infection. Okay, so we just want to know that how many patient days were actually device days. Okay, so device utilization ratio is a very simple parameter where you can at a glance understand that whether an ICU is having a very high utilization ratio of ventilators, central lines or even any catheters. That means a large number of patients are actually on a particular device, right? So the ventilator utilization ratio is calculated by dividing the number of ventilator days by patient days. And it is always a ratio, so it has to be less than one. You can multiply it by 100 to get how many patient days were actually also ventilator days. And that gives you an idea that, okay, if the ventilator, ventilator ratio is uh, 0.9, that means that ICU has uh, a huge uh, utilization ratio of ventilator. That means uh, most of the patient days are also ventilator days and that means there is a very high risk for development of ventilator associated pneumonia. So coming to the case report form for VAP, the first part of the case report form as per BSI and UTI, it requires basic demographic information about the patient. The second part of the case report form has been developed exactly as per the case definition. So you have to write the date of event and I have told you how to find the date of event. Then you have to fill whether the patient was on mechanical ventilation at any time on the date of event or the day before the date of event. So it is a yes, no kind of database. If yes, was the ventilator in place for more than two calendar days? So again, you just have to write yes or no to all these answers. 
Then the second part, the third part is the X-ray finding. Did the patient have a new and persistent or progressive and persistent infiltrate consolidation or cavitation? So it is again yes or no and with date. The B.1 is whether the patient had one of the following that is fever, leukocytosis or leukopenia and for elderly is altered mental status. Yes or no and with date. If it is a yes, what was the date? And the B.2 is the characters that we just discussed. Onset of new uh, purulent uh, sputum, change in character of sputum, increased respiratory section, uh, suctioning requirement, increased respiratory sex, uh, secretions, new onset or worsening cough, dyspnea, tachypnea, and worsening gas exchange. So again, yes or no, along with date. And the C part is the lab findings that we just discussed, whether it was a culture positive, microscopy positive, um, uh, atypical organisms, or in immunocompromised patient, a matching candida from blood and respiratory sample. So these are all just from the definition, a yes or no, along with the date. The next part of the case report form asks you for the short term outcome, that is the 14 day patient outcome, whether the patient is still in the ICU, transferred, discharged, left or died, and then the long term outcome, again the same parameter. And the final part of the case report form asks you about the organisms which have been isolated from culture uh, and their antibiotic sensitivity. So it is just a drop down menu in our database. You just have to select the organism and its antibiotic sensitivity. So again, you have a number of choices to add on organism. As I said, within a 14 day time frame, if you find another organism, you just have to add on to that. So this is the device uh, denominator data collection form. So if you are actually doing all the three modules, you can use the same denominator in the ICU. So this is the column for number of patients. Each bed, just write the numbers on each day. So this is 31, all the dates, number of patients on central line, police catheter and ventilator. And at the end of the month, you just add here and this will give you the total number of patient days, central line days, urinary catheter days and ventilator days. So how do you collect denominator data? I have already mentioned that denominator data should be collected at the same time every day, even on weekends or holidays. It should reflect only the patients who are present in the surveillance unit. Data collection can be done by staff, the surveillance staff or clinical staff. So, so on-floor staff can also do that, provided it is done at the same time every day. Each ICU should have its own denominator data. So if it's a medical ICU, it should have a separate denominator, a surgical ICU, a separate denominator. So denominator counts are recorded in the form for each day. The daily counts are added up at the end of each month and the form is given to the central surveillance coordinator. And at the end of each month, it is to be submitted. And with each month, you are add a new case report form. So this is all about the WAP module. Uh, if you have any queries, I can take them before I hand over to Dan. And then your database person who has developed our databases, you will be given a hands-on demonstration of how the database works and how the data flows in our network. So um, I'll be happy to take a few questions. So there is a question if a patient is having FiO2 40 on third ventilator day and 50 on fourth and thereafter 100, do we need to repeat the report the case as there is no stability of FiO2 on two previous days? So as you would know, if you have, if some of you have read the ventilator associated events definition, the respiratory requirements have to be monitored every hour. Okay, so unless there is a consecutive uh, uh, deranged uh, entry of the uh, FiO2, you, you cannot take that as a parameter, okay? So your question is right that if there is no stability, you cannot take that. And that is why we have given a number of choices to you. 
and that is why we say that VAE or IVAC is very difficult in our situation because you need continuous monitoring of these respiratory parameters, which becomes very difficult uh, in an ICU, which, which we all know we are facing shortage of staff. So one staff who just keeps on monitoring these PEEP and FIO2 and then two consecutive reading uh, in consecutive hour is very difficult. So your question is right, we cannot take that because there is no consistency. Um, one of the question is what is the purpose of window period? I am again and again telling that when you need a window period because to define any case, uh, say if you're talking about typhoid, right? Um, or for any infection, say tuberculosis, there is a definite set of criteria, say meningitis or sinusitis. There is A, B, C, D. These are the defining criteria, okay? Now, these defining criteria have to happen within a set time frame. We cannot say that it's a case of urinary tract infection because the patient had fever today and 30 days after that he had a culture positive or he had a dysuria after 15 days. So, all the parameters or the criteria that we have for defining a particular infection must occur within our set time frame. Because here we are talking about surveillance. We are not talking about individual diagnosis of one patient where the clinicians really rack their brains to diagnose a particular infection because they have to treat that particular case. Here you have to do a case analysis to understand the trend and that is why you have to define a case in a particular time frame. And the window period is a period where all during those seven days, all the defining criteria must be met. Only then you can say, okay, this fits the case definition, okay? It cannot be that one criteria occurs today, the other criteria occurs after 10 days. So window period is very important because everything that defines a particular infection must happen within that seven days, okay? And again, it is needed because out of that, whatever happened first becomes your date of event. So I think that should be very clear by now why we need the window period. So microbiological criteria, you want uh, one more clarification, you will be getting these slides which will be uploaded. It is just one of these criteria, okay? So it is either a positive culture, which is 10 to the power 5, quantitative or semi-quantitative, either from bal, endotracheal aspirate or sputum, or a culture positive pleural fluid, or more than 5% bal cells contain intracellular bacteria on microscopy. It can also be a definitive diagnosis of fungal infection through histopath or cultures or some atypical organisms that you've identified through molecular or serological tests. And only for immunocompromised patients, you can take candida if there is a matching culture from blood and respiratory samples. Otherwise, you have to ignore candida species, spawns, and enterococci. One of you is asking, it is called VAE and not VAP. I have I started my lecture with that. Probably you missed that. It is very difficult to do VAE because you need continuous monitoring and it's very, very difficult in the Indian setup. You can do VAE if you have the staffing, if you have the resources, you can do that. But at a network level, we, it's very difficult to do VAE. We have done a multi-centric study in which we found that Doing VAE is really not sustainable and that is why probably you missed out the initial part. Uh, one of the question is what might be the justification of pleural fluid? Pleural fluid is very justified because it is the only sterile fluid. Uh, we say that a, a brush specimen of, um, you know, bronchoscopy is also a very good sample because it collects uh, the cells of the alveoli through the brush. Otherwise, even a bile sample can be... Um, can get contaminated through upper respiratory flora while you are taking out the bronchoscope. So that is why if you get something from pleural fluid, it's like a lung aspirate. It's a very, very sterile fluid and that is why it is taken as uh, a criteria for that. Uh, one of the question is, is there any defined time interval for the serial x-ray to know persistent x-ray findings as different patients? And, and that is, yeah, you are very right. So persistent means, uh, so it ha ideally it should be a progressive X-ray finding or a persistent consolidation. So sometimes in trauma patient, there is atelectasis, you know, one day you find that the lung is collapsed and the other day it's so absolutely okay. 
So there is no time frame, and that's why um, I'm again and again emphasizing that for X-ray, you really need to have inputs from the intensivist or the radiologist. Um, Dr. Renu Gupta is saying we have been doing VA surveillance at IBA since two years according to CDC criteria. As part of AIMS, would you uh, want to start VAP? Uh, so if you want to uh, do VAP according to our network, you have to do it additionally, but it's optional. If you are doing VAE and you are okay, and uh, you you can keep on doing that uh, the VAE because it is okay for institutions. Uh, many hospitals are who are well resourced uh, are doing VAE surveillance. But if it is like for BSI and UTI, uh, we always say that for this network we need these definitions. So there are many hospitals which may be using a separate definitions for UTI. Supposing you are not doing candida in your normal surveillance, but we want that for our surveillance network, you stick to the protocol that we are proposing. It's because only when we are all doing the same, we have a data which is represented. Um, in case of bad, why is it necessary to give coronary so one of the question is that in case of bell, why is it necessary to give colony count? That for that, uh, you can uh, read uh, the review articles on diagnosis of VAP. Okay, you have excellent review articles on diagnostics for VAP, and there has been ample discussion uh, in the scientific world. You need a quantitative or semi-quantitative cultures from respiratory sample now. The most unideal sample is sputum sample, where you definitely need the PAR-5 and uh, also uh, the quality of sputum that the first cells to epithelial cells ratio. Everything is important because it is contaminated uh, by upper respiratory pleura. When you go do lower down a tracheal aspirate, it is again contaminated with upper respiratory pleura because you are doing it. If you are doing it through tracheostomy, that tracheostomy site is very often colonized with upper respiratory pleura. Now, even for bronchoalveolar levage, you need a quantitative culture because when you are taking out the bronchoscope, there is a very high chance that it may be contaminated with upper respiratory pleura. So, respiratory tract per se is not a sterile site, right? For a patient who is on ventilator, there is a very high chance that the patient keeps on micro aspirating, you know, so the upper respiratory pleura does go down. And that is why a quantitative culture is recommended for bronchoalveolar levage. Now, what is the cutoff is up to you. Some people say it should be 10 to the power 5 for BAL. And some review says it should be 10 to the power 4 for BAL and 10 to the power 5 for tracheal aspirate. But definitely we need a cutoff for bronchoalveolar levage also. Uh, the cutoff is something you can decide. Is one question, what about VAP surveillance for patient already presenting with pneumonia? So, uh, VAP surveillance on patient already presenting with pneumonia, I really don't understand uh, the exact context in which you are asking. So, already existing pneumonia and the patient has developed, uh, is ventilated and then develops VAP and that is why that is the problem with defining a VAP and that is why the X-ray finding of a progressive or new infiltrate. So your question is very valid that a patient has probably, I, probably you meant that the patient had a community acquired pneumonia and he was intubated and then how do you call VAP? I agree that it is very difficult and that is where the X-ray findings have to be really, really collaborated or corroborated by the intensivist or the radiologist because as I said, it is either a new or progressive infiltrate. So on a, in a patient who has pneumonia, if you find new or progressive infiltrate, then you have a positive culture, then you have worsening of gas uh, exchange parameters, worsening. So everything is a progressive thing, right? If a patient has pneumonia and you find new onset, only then you can say that it's a new episode or it's an episode of VAP. And that is where continuous monitoring is needed. And you need A plus B1 plus B2 plus C. So all these criteria have to be there to call it as ventilator associated pneumonia. Last question. Why cause enterococcus and candida species to be excluded in 
Okay, so one more question is why cons candida enterococcus are to be excluded because they are all upper respiratory pollen analysis. You will not see coagulis negative staph causing ventilator associated pneumonia or enterococcus or candida species. They are well known upper respiratory pollen analysis and that is why they have to be excluded. So that finishes the VAC module and now I invite uh, Dr. Daniel van der Ende, who is from the CDC country office. We'll be talking about uh, a protocol for surveillance of surgical site infection, which is again India specific. And it has been developed after um, a lot of discussion uh, with the Ministry of Health, the Maternal and Child Division, uh, the Lakshya program, uh, because we thought that Surgical site infection is something that we were missing out in our country uh, and it's a very important uh, infection acquired in the hospital. As you would have seen that the CDC's NHSN definition for surgical site infection require is, is uh, very clearly defined. These infections are mostly acquired when the patient leaves the hospital. So as as opposed to the infection that we have discussed since yesterday, which is blood stream infection, UTI and VAP, uh, you stop the surveillance once the patient goes out of the ICU, right? Because the risk of acquiring infection is the presence of device and the patient is housed there. Surgical site infection is an exception because most of the surgical site infections develop when the patient reaches home, okay? Because, because of the policy of early discharges now, uh, and that is where the problem lies that to coin a patient as having surgical site infection, you need prolonged follow ups, which becomes very difficult because the patient is already out of the healthcare facility. And with that in mind, and the importance of surgical site infection in uh, cesarean sections, we started with a definition. I think I hand over to uh, Dr. Van der Ende now. He will tell the story that we built upon and how we came up with a new protocol for surgical site infections. So over to you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Porva, and welcome everyone. I think it's fantastic that everyone's here interested in doing healthcare associated infection surveillance. It's a big step for many of you to um, be trained and understand one of these protocols. I think for historical perspective, a lot of you are trying to reach NHSN definitions. And one thing that's very important to understand is that the definitions that are being used now are not the definitions that were started with in the 1970s. The definitions that the United States started with were much simpler because of the capacity, because of what was needed at the time. And over time, they evolved. And I think that's important to understand and just recognize that in India, as well as many countries, we have hospitals that are very modern and performing and have a lot of resources and also hospitals that have less. But to do surveillance, you have to use the same definitions. So as Dr. Porva is pointing out, it's important that we use definitions that can work for everyone while we try to continue. Um, for surgical site infections, this protocol that was developed has been piloted in, in several other countries before India. And the, the lecture program allowed us to pilot it in a few sites in Gujarat right before COVID. And we learned a lot. And so I'll be sharing some of those lessons. As Dr. Porva mentioned, this protocol is something that can be done in any hospital even down to a, a CHC because it doesn't require a lab. That doesn't mean that you can't use a lab. It just means that this particular definite, this particular protocol doesn't require a laboratory. So I'll share the screen and then I think Dr. Porva, you're uh,
Dan, you can share your screen. Uh, yes, we can see that. Can see. Okay. So while there are many different surgical site infections, the one that we're focused on is for C sections. C sections are a great place to start. If you haven't done any surveillance, this particular protocol is a great way for you to build your capacity to do surveillance. These forms that you see on the screen are the only forms that you will need. There is a safe surgery checklist, which is done at the time of surgery, and many of you may already be using this as a best practice. There is a case report form, which is very simple. And then at 30 days, there's a discharge script that you'll use to call the patients to ask about their symptoms. These information is then put into a database and the picture of that database from Ames is on the screen. So, again, we're keeping it simple, but because it's simple doesn't mean that it's going to be, um, you know, no, no effort. So, let's just go ahead and define what a surgical site infection is. So, this is an infection that occurs where the procedure happened or near it within 30 days. <laughs> well, we recognize that most infections occur in the first two weeks. Standard of 30 days allows us to capture the majority of these infections. If you want to type in the chat, what do you think are some common causes of surgical site infections? Hygiene, sterility, some really great answers. <laughs> so here we have contamination. So it could be the skin wasn't cleaned or it's dirty. That contamination of the skin or it's contamination in the procedure. And why do we care? So we care because it's a common, they happen every day. They cause death, suffering. They cost your time as clinical providers. They, they add to healthcare costs. They also take away from patients quality of life, their ability to work. And we also care because we know that we can prevent them. If we do hand washing, simple infection control, best practices for wound care, if we use appropriate antibiotics, then we can prevent them. So we have something that's common, has a big impact and can be prevented. And how do we do this? Many of you have kind of put this in the chat. We need to have good environmental cleaning. We make sure our equipment's sterile. Those procedures are in place. There's appropriate wound care. And that our surgical practice limits the infection. So the reason that we do surveillance is to understand how many surgical site infections we have. So often what we see is in sites that don't have any surveillance system for healthcare associated infections. When there is an infection, there's not clarity on if it's isolated or if there's a pattern. 
it's important then to make sure that we're capturing all patients to understand the pattern of infections. So when you do this surveillance, you should expect that you'll be able to understand your surgical site infection rate over a month, two months, six months, and a year. The number of procedures you perform, what kind of patients you're treating, how you're using your surgical safety checklist, and you're going to be able then to leverage this information to target infection control, target prevention, improve your outcomes as a facility. The information as it comes in aggregate from you can inform state and national policy and also best practices. So not only are you contributing to your own site's success, by doing this, you're informing state and national best practices. And then of course, if there's ways to leverage that, you could also be teaching other countries about how to have best practices. To do this, it requires a team. You have to put designated staff to do this protocol or any HAI protocol. Infection control nurses that are dedicated and trained are vital. They have a different skill set than the floor nurses. And investing in them and retaining them will be a great help to you. You will also need your regular clinical units to identify these cases, your healthcare infection control committees to address issues that come up, and also someone to help with data entry analysis and communicate that up to your staff, your leadership. If we're looking at the steps, what do you have to do to start this surveillance? First step is have a safe surgery checklist and make sure that it's being done. If you already have that, that's great. The second is after surgery, you do a wound check and you put it into your, the case report form. At discharge, you do the same. You keep these forms in a designated place. And at 30 days, you have somebody call the patient and record the findings. Once you have this information, <laughs> excuse me, you put this data to work. You review the data, make sure it's correct, analyze it, and then use the results. So this does take some effort to set up, but once it's set up, it should be fairly straightforward. The safe surgery checklist and surveillance forms are a checklist and a record of the safe surgery checklist and also the data collection form. So again, two forms, straightforward, trying to keep it as simple as possible. So here, in the safe surgery checklist, you're getting, and the, uh, the case report form, you're collecting patient data, you're doing before anesthesia, for incision, after wound closure, and infection surveillance. So those are the key areas of data collection. This is the case definition. <laughs> As you can see, there is no laboratory component. It asks within the 30 days from the surgery, was there pus coming from the wound or around the wound or an abscess? Was there fever, redness, pain? Was there any reopening of the wound? These are all clinical findings.
So we, as we've kind of done this in many different settings, we've had a couple frequently asked questions. Why do we focus on C-section? One, it's a clean wound. And so because of that, when you have an infection from a C-section, as opposed to a traumatic injury where it could be dirty, it means that something went wrong that was preventable. There isn't a lot of comorbidities, although there is the diabetes, obesity, hypertension thing. You know, may make caring for these patients a little bit more complicated, but in general, young, healthy women are low risk of infection. We also want to repeat, it's preventable. So whenever you have an infection, the key is to look back and say, how could we have prevented it? And we also know that women and infants are a vulnerable patient population. So why don't we include lab? Wound infection doesn't require lab confirmation. That's not to say that it isn't helpful. But what often happens is that wound culture of a wound gives multiple organisms because the collection of specimens is not done properly. And that is confusing for the microbiologist, it's confusing for the clinicians. And in the end, if you have a diagnosis, then you're able to treat it. Expense is often a reason why it's not done. And we also know that in some hospitals, the ability to do culture is not consistent or it's much diff more difficult to access and get a result in a timely manner. So this is a reason why it's not used. If you do have access to a laboratory, if you are very good at sampling, then by all means, you can continue to do that. And for using that as a resource for your own institution, we encourage that. But for the purposes of using that as a case definition, it's not part of our case definition. When this was done in different settings, we did a assessment and said, for the staff that are implementing the protocol, what was the feedback? And again, we had piloted this in many countries, a few other countries. And so we were able to kind of start with a better uh, draft. We were able to get some great feedback from the sites, make some changes. And what they reported back is that the case definition was easy to understand and the protocol was good and the case report forms were easy to fill. They could report it monthly they were able to do it as part of the regular routine using designated staff. There has to be some staff designated to this, but they were able to do it. So let's go through the protocol itself. Again, these are all the forms that are there, and this is part of the protocol that's available at HEI's India website. So let's use this also to discuss some things around surveillance. So one, surveillance is here. NQAS wants you to do it, NABH wants you to do it. If you're part of the lecture program, they want you to do it. I think that many of you that are part of the lecture program have quality circle teams that are already trained in doing quality improvement and have a system for reviewing these data and targeting infection prevention. And through COVID, there's a recognition that infection prevention control is important and needs to stay. 
one of the reasons that surgical site infection surveillance is being given through AIMS is that it needs to be standardized. Everyone needs to use the same definitions to have comparability. <laughs> if everyone uses different definitions, that's not the only uh, surveillance isn't, um, you can't aggregate the information. You can't use it as a state. You can't use it as a country. It has to be standardized. The other important thing is that it's very important to have infection prevention control focal points. Their roles aren't always well defined in some institutions, but more and more they're being recognized as a vital part of the hospital. Countries, ministries, as well as administrators are also trying to get cost effective methodology. So there's a lot of resources that can be done and can be pushed toward doing surveillance, but it has to be cost effective for you to do it. Second, it has to give you data that's actionable. If we're not able to give you data on your surgical site infections that you can use to target infection control, then it's not doing what it should do. And it should also be used to understand if it's making a difference. Are your rates going down? Overall, we want a culture that has safer surgeries. So surveillance offers the opportunity to provide feedback to surgeons, to the hospital, to administration, that safer surgeries are being done. The setting for this is going to be inpatient or outpatient settings where C-sections are performed. So the initial work that we did, one was in a medical hospital, one was in a district hospital, one was in a community health center. It worked in all of the settings. Each facility needs to designate staff to do the surveillance. There should be a dedicated staff nurse, preferably an ICN to lead it. You should get approval from your healthcare leadership and have an infection control committee that can take action. There also should be at every site a policy that says a single dose of prophylactic antibiotic should be given as part of the protocol. Many times in India, when we visited sites, We've also seen it in a lot of countries is that there's a tendency to prescribe antibiotics through the hospital stay and even after for what should be considered a clean surgery. This is not best practice. And the reasons that it's given is often because of fear that appropriate procedures weren't followed. Having surgical site infections allows you to understand if you're really having infections or not, allows you to improve your infection prevention. And we don't need to be using additional antibiotics, which can cause increased resistance, which affects patients that come afterwards and also for future generations that will come after us. So again, our case definition is very simple. Is there pus? from the wound or evidence of an abscess, fever with pain, redness, or reopening. If there are similar to other HAIs, a difference of opinion, and the clinician says, I, I know it doesn't have this, but I believe that there's an infection and I'm going to treat it. The clinician has to do what they feel is best for the patient. For the purposes of surveillance, that's still counted as not a surgical site infection. On the flip side, if there are these findings and the clinician says, I don't want to treat it, then it still should be counted as a surgical site infection. It has nothing to do with the clinical care 
It has everything to do with understanding how the hospital is doing with surgical site infections in aggregate as a whole and monitoring trends. And to monitor trends, you have to have a consistent definition, knowing that you may miss some cases, you may add some additional cases, but being pretty good, mostly good, is okay for surveillance. Again, for sites that have capacity, collecting bacterial culture sensitivity can be done, but it's not part of this particular protocol. This is where you record your data on the case report. It's a series of yes and no questions that correspond to the case definition. The first check done, three days at discharge, knowing that some hospitals will discharge on day four, some on day five, some later than that. And then at 30 days, what were the results? It's important as you undertake this to identify what your current infection prevention control policies and practices are. If you're going to make improvements, you should understand what that is. Starting with something like the IPCAF tool is a great place to understand where you are. Your Population is going to be C-sections. Some hospitals have initially started with one ward and just doing surveillance on that one ward. Other facilities have found that to be a little bit harder to do and have chosen to do all wards. You should start small and expand. Always work with your surgical team. It's very important that the microbiology department, infection control team, work very closely with your clinical providers. It's important that they use the surgical safety checklist, that you come to an agreement about how the information is going to be fed back to them. Again, we're using these forms. They're simple forms. <coughs> This is the safe surgery checklist from WHO. It's tried and tested, freely available. And if we can make this just part of routine, not just for C-sections, but for all surgeries, it goes a long way to preventing infections. Here, we have the safe surgery checklist case report form. Some key things to point out is the birth companion name and phone number. Many sites lose patients to follow up because they do not have accurate contact information. And this has been a focus on their part once they recognize this to make sure that they have the appropriate phone contact numbers. So giving this information to you ahead of time, when you start to do this protocol, Make sure that you have a good system for collecting contact information. For those that are using um, birth companions, and if there's a regional approach to that, the ASHA workers, some of them are collecting the ASHA workers as well so that they can be a, a way to contact the patient. There are a few extra things here. If there's supply issues, so that you can keep track if that's a particular need, then wound class, but this is not part of our case definition. And for all of our C-sections, it would be clean. We also are very wondering if it's elective or emergent. We know that in C-sections, emergent procedures have a higher rate of wound infections. So decreasing that as a best practice is important. But you can't do that unless you know and can track how many of your procedures were elective or emergent. 
to do surveillance, you have to find all the cases. In your own system, you should have a way to understand how many patients had a C-section and where that information is recorded. And that has to be in a consistent place so that all C-sections can be found and followed up. Methods for doing this could be when you're doing the wound assessments, surgical notes, if there's registers, <laughs> verbal communications, your particular facility is likely to have a specific uh, way that you can make sure that all patients are found. And again, when you do that, you're recording the results, if they have an infection or not, three days discharge and at 30 days. At 30 days, you are going to call the patient. There is a script and this script is very simple and corresponds to clinical findings that can be answered by the patient. A patient can look at their wound and say if they've got pus coming in. They can tell you the color. They can tell you if it smells. They can tell you about what time they figured out. They can tell you if it's red. They can tell you if it's opening up. All of these are things that can be done over the phone. There also may be situations where the patients are coming back to the clinic for a regular checkup. If your institution has that, it may be another step for you finding cases in addition to the 30 days. So a question for you, if you're doing surgical site infection surveillance and a patient comes back to the clinic and they have a surgical site infection, would you need to call that patient at 30 days? So I'm getting a mix of answers of yes and no. So the answer is no. Once a patient is diagnosed with a surgical site infection, that ends the surveillance. The whole reason for doing the surveillance is, do they have a surgical site infection? Yes or no. If they have that infection in the hospital, they have an infection, you don't need to do anything else. That's documented in your case report form as a positive, and you don't have to call in 30 days. You close the case report form, and you don't need to do anything else. And again, this you'll get these slides, but this again is all of the simple yes, no questions that you'll ask the patient as part of your discharge. We do put a question on antibiotics here. This information is not part of the case report form, but it was added because we also know that antibiotic use in this group is often overprescribed. And so if you're tracking this data, it allows you to understand potential overuse of antibiotics. Another common scenario is a patient leaves the hospital and they move. Let's just say they, they go back home and they have their baby and they move to a different state. And you're unable to find them. They change their phone number or it, you don't have a good system for getting phone numbers and you're unable to find that patient. How do you record that patient? So let's just say the patient came at three days in the hospital, had no wound infection. When they left the hospital, they had no wound infection and they were lost to follow up. Do you record that as a positive, a negative, or remove it from your data?
And again, the answer that I'm going to give is based on surveillance and how we use surveillance. So the last recorded event, so when they were discharged, there was no infection. Therefore, they will be no SSI and you will retain them in your data. You will also record them as a loss to follow up. If you only have a few loss to follow up, it's not going to affect your overall surgical site infection rate. If you have a 60% loss to follow-up, it will not accurately reflect your SSI rate. So again, surveillance is trying to get the majority of the population. If there are some that are missing, it's okay as long as it's just not too many. Once you have too many lost to follow up, then it will affect your rates and you can't rely on it to know if you're doing well or need to have improved infection control. The majority of time in our sites, the reason that they're lost to follow up is that the patient's phone number was not reachable or recorded. So if you're gonna focus on one area initially to ensure that you have good follow-up, it's gonna be the contact information. Denominators are essential. You have to know the number of all procedures performed, the number of emergent and the number of elective. And this is having a good system at your hospital where you can record this and most in our experience, most of the hospitals have this information in a designated place. But it's very important that this be recorded as part of surveillance. So again, the safe surgery checklist, the case report form is all the documents that you need. You need to do data entry regularly it should be monthly. You should have some kind of check on your data. And I'll go through some examples here where you can see where not having that check could lead to a problem. So if you have a data entry operator, you have to ensure that they're entering that case report form correctly. You can only, you're, you're only gonna be as good as your, the quality of your data. For data analysis, it's simple. The surgical site infections per 100 procedures. Divide the number of SSIs by the number of procedures, multiply by 100. It's not complicated. This is a picture of the data flow. And there's lots of things here, but really what you're looking here is perioperative period, day three, you're doing wound check number one, discharge, you're doing wound check number two, discharge, wound check number three. You complete your case report form, you enter them into the database, that goes to Ames, Ames then has that, you get calculated rates, SSI rates, it goes to the facility, and then you can use that information for your surgical teams in your administration. There are roles and responsibilities for the, the, the sites. There has to be a lead for these protocols. So this is your site uh, PI. They're the ones that are going to monitor and evaluate and get the results and make sure the protocol is done effectively. You have to have an infection control nurse to lead and make sure that the, the forms are completed to make sure the data is correct. And you have to have a clinical provider that can really understand what the protocol is, receive the information, help to target infection prevention control. 
the AIM staff and our staff provides technical assistance, can help with summarization. We can help come troubleshoot if there's sites that need assistance and provide subject matter expertise for specific questions that arise either as the data is coming together or if there are particular problems that we see across sites. Some sites ask us, well, you know, is this something that we're going to be um, needing approval for? Is this something that we just kind of have to, um, is it a study? And the answer is no. When we're doing healthcare associated infection surveillance, when we're doing surgical site infection surveillance, this is part of routine hospital work. This is done in every hospital as a best practice. And so getting individual patient consent is not necessary. If there are specific reasons to do that in your own institution or own state, then I'll have you take that up with your state or your institution. But in general, we don't need to do this as part of of these uh, protocols. Uh, I think that entering it into the database will be covered by Pranav in the next session. And in the next uh, few slides, I just want to go into how to use the data. This is a simple cycle where we're implementing surgical site infection surveillance. You're collecting that data, you're uploading it into the database, but then every month, it's really important that you meet with your HSCC to review that information. If you're collecting the data only and you're not reviewing it, the question is, why are you doing surveillance? It's only good enough if you're able to target your infection prevention and control activities. And to do that, you have to understand if your rates are going up or down or staying the same. Once you put those into your HSCC and you make improvements, then again, you analyze your data, you discuss it, you see where you can target. Here is a, a graph from one of the sites. If you can type in the chat, what do you see in this graph? What are some of the conclusions that you as an individual or as a team can make from just looking at these particular graphs? So one thing that's very obvious is that it's variable. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. So the question then becomes, why are rates so variable? Why are we good some months? Why are we not good some months? Do we have a data quality issue? Do some months we have better data quality? Could be. When we look at these individual cases, was there a reason why we had this case? Was this all emergent procedures? So even though we're using a very simple protocol, you shouldn't underestimate the amount of information that you can get from the protocol. Let's look at this graph. What can you say about this information. And again, this is from two separate sites. Right, so you're saying you're saying in some months it's tend to be higher than others. 
there's a lot of emergency cases, right? And we know that emergency cases lead to higher SSI rates. So this was during COVID. So one of the questions that came up is, is COVID affecting our high emergency rates? So you had a context that was relevant for the time, but if you don't have COVID and you have a lot of emergent SSIs, why do you have so many? Is there a way to reduce that? You were trying to figure that out and then doing a root cause analysis to see if you could fix it. If you have interventions to reduce your emergency, the number of emergency SSIs, you can then continue to follow this and see if they're making a difference. Let's have you look at this. These again, two different sites, and this is data on length of stay. So in your data, you have a date of procedure and you have a date of discharge. And from that, you can collect information on how long that patient was in the hospital. So from this, this data, what questions do you have? Uh, can anyone hear me? I think it's like. Yes, Dan, you can. You are audible. Audible. Okay. All right. So on this graph from these two sites, what questions or what kind of conclusions are you wanting to know? Or can you draw? So one, there's a difference between the two sites. It's the same procedure, right? And this is length of stay. This is not cases. So here you have number of days in the hospital in which month. So you have differences in length of stay for the same procedure in two different sites. So you would wonder why is the length of stay in one hospital always four? And why is it three and two in another hospital? What's the difference? Whenever I see the same number, it calls into question the data quality. Because you know, as clinicians, people don't always have the same outcome, right? You can't predict that someone's always going to stay four days for the whole year. It's not really reasonable. So you have to wonder, do I have good data quality? I need to understand that. And if it is, why is there so much variability? Is there an opportunity for improvement? So just to acknowledge, Ames team has been working very hard over the last few years on this. NHSRC, Luxia team have all um, been very supportive, especially in the early pilots, as well as the, the government of Gujarat. And we did this during right before COVID and into that year. And then our team in Atlanta, especially Matt Westerkamp, who was driving this protocol, uh, and our team here, including Bolin, has been fantastic. So thanks. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if we can go to some of the questions. Thank you so much. So are there any particular questions on this protocol or on SSI surveillance? Dan, do you want us to read the question or you will read it yourself? 
Lesson I can read it. Uh, I think if you can, you can ask the questions because you may have. Okay. Particular ones that you want me to get to. Can we stop sharing the slide? That says getting the yeah. yeah. I will just read out the question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sue, for such a lucid and wonderful explanation. So there are some questions. Uh, the first question is why there is a 30 day waiting period. So the 30 day waiting period is to ensure that all SSIs are captured. We understand that most of the SSIs will occur within the first 12 days. If we look at the literature, but the 30 day is standard for capturing all SSIs. So you're not going to miss any surgical site infections if you're at 30 days. That does not mean that, you know, if you call on day 29 or 28 or 31 or 32, that's still okay because you're capturing it within that window. But the reason that we had a 30 day is because that will allow you to capture all SSIs. Now, the next question is how to decide what antibiotics should be given other than the other procedure without laboratory confirmation. Yeah, so WHO has put out a guide with prophylactic antibiotic and best practices. If your own institution has uh, recommendations and have made those recommendations because your antibiotic stewardship committee has put together those recommendations, then you should, you know, follow those. In some institutions, it's it's dependent upon what's available on a regular basis. If you have certain you know, antibiograms that you've done or that indicate that certain antibiotics should be used, then you should go with those. But the standards ones would be WHO recommended ones. The second would be, or you know, first would be your own institution or state recommendations. And then, of course, if there's particular reasons based on an antibiogram that has enough information to be specific for your your OB population, that would be a third. Okay. So the next question is. Um, if the same lab can give reliable results of BSI, UTI, and VAP, then why there is an exception for SSN? Again, if you have a laboratory and want to do culture, you are free to do the culture. There's nothing in the protocol that says that you can't add additional items that you feel are important for your particular patient population and you have access to. For surveillance and having the same definition be used across all sites, there is a small core of information, which is all clinical information that's going to be collected from all sites. But in no way does that keep you from doing laboratory cultures. Now, the next question is, is laboratory confirmation required for orthopedic surgery? So this particular protocol is related to C-section surveillance. We haven't really branched out into surveillance for other wounds or other surgeries. That may be something that, you know, with AIMS and in partnership with AIMS, we kind of get into at a later date. But for the purposes of starting this particular protocol, we're focused on C-sections. Next question is, what if pain and erythema is there without fever? Can it be considered an SSI? So, if we're looking at the case definition, if you have pain and erythema, it's likely that you're going to have a fever as well. So, um, the answer to that is it's probably going to be a considered an SSI because you have pain, redness, and you're knowing that fevers come and go. So this is where you're asking the patient too, do you have fevers?
Oh, yeah. The next question is, can we train the patients on wound care at home before discharge? So post discharge instructions to the patients and how they care for the wounds is an important part of how you manage these wounds. So for every institution, that is a best practice and can help prevent surgical site infections. And I know that many hospitals do that already. Oh, the last question is, is there any prescribed frequency for reviewing antibiogram? Uh, generally, that's a question for the microbiology department. I'll leave that for Dr. Purva. What do you say, Dr. Porter? The question is, the question is, is there any prescribed frequency for reviewing antibiogram? Yes, so the ICMR, generally antibiogram should not be very frequent. So the general frequency should be six months. If you see ICMR and NCDC publishes their antibiogram yearly. So it depends on the number of isolates that you get, but generally six months, it should not be done more frequently than six months, but ideally an yearly antibiogram would be helpful. So that's all for the questions. And if anybody has any more questions, they can email it to us. So thank you so much sir, for, for the wonderful explanation. Now I welcome Mr. Pranav Kastha. He's a co-founder of uh, Code Painters and Oxygen Times, and he is the one behind designing our HUI surveillance website and databases of HUI surveillance. And he has been a huge, huge help. So over to Pranav. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. So uh, before we start the training, I'll quickly share my screen. Hello everyone. I am Pranav Kastha, the co-founder of Code Painters and Oxygen Times. And uh, my company has developed this software for HAI surveillance. And today I'm going to give you training on how to use this application to enter the data and how to review the data as well. So in this training, you will learn the types of users who will use the application and how the data flows between them. After that, you will learn how to access the web application, which is usually through Google Chrome browser only. And then you will learn how to enter case report forms and denominator data. And when they are entered, how they can be reviewed or disapproved by the principal investigators. And after that, how to delete forms if entered by mistake and view reports and ex export the data to Excel. Starting with the types of users and how the data flows between them. So mainly there are three types of users who access this application. First is data entry operators. Second are surveillance coordinators, which is mostly handled by the PIs. And finally, uh, the data reaches the AIMS team, which is the third type of users. So this is how the data flows. So uh, the data entry operator and so the data entry operator enters the data. When they enter, it reaches the surveillance coordinator or the PI. Now, the, if the PI feels that there is something that needs to be changed, they can send it back to the data entry operator. And then the data entry operator can update the form and send it back to the PI. And now if the PI feels that everything is all right, they will just click on approve button and the form will reach the AIMS team. Sure, sure, I'll go a little slow. So, there are mainly three types of users who access the web application. This web application first are data entry operators. First are data entry operators who enter the data. Then when they enter the data, it reaches the surveillance coordinators, which is mostly handled by the principal investigators of the hospital. 
and then PIs can either approve or disapprove the form. Once they approve, the form reaches the AIMS team. So this is how the data flows. So data is entered by data entry operator. The first box on the left that you see, when the when they enter the form, it reaches the PIs panel, the principal investigators panel. Now the PI can either approve or disapprove the form. If they feel that uh, if they feel that there is something that needs to be changed, they can send it back. They just they'll just click on the review button and send it back to the data entry operator. Now the data entry operator will make the required changes, and when they submit, it will reach again the PI, and then PI can approve it. Now once the PI approves the form, it reaches the AIMS team. And finally, if the AIMS team feels that there is something that needs to be changed in the form, they can send it back to the PI and then the PI can either add their comment and send it back to the AIMS team or send it back to the data entry operator for updates. So in simple words, this is pretty simple. In simple words, uh, the PI acts as a bridge between the data entry operator and the AIMS team to check the quality of the data and if it meets all the quality standards. Does anyone have any question till now? Okay, so uh, we'll proceed. Moving on to how to access the web application. So uh, I'll quickly demonstrate it over here, but uh, on uh, after the presentation, you can also reach out to the AIMS team and they will hand over your hospitals, your particular DEO and PIS credentials with you, and then you can access the application, but I'll quickly demonstrate. So it's it's quite simple. You just have to go on to hisindia.com. You don't have to do it right now. I'll just demonstrate it. And then you click on the application login button. When you click on this button, you will be redirected to the login screen where you have to enter your own credentials and based on your credentials, you will see your own hospital or DEO's panel. Now, once the data entry operator logs in, they will be able to enter a new case report form. I'll show it how to do that. So in order to enter a new case report form, th so this is the first screen that a data entry operator will see. And there's a green button at the top report new case. I'll demonstrate this as well. I'm just showing it right now. So uh, this is the first screen that you will see. You have to click on this button report new case. When you click on this, you will see a case report form, which is the exact replica of your physical copy. And when you click on that, you can submit and the data will be submitted. I'll just demonstrate it now. So this is the after uh, opening the website, HISindia.com, you click on the application login. When you do that, this is the screen that you see. And here you have to enter your own hospital's credentials and click on login. So when you do this, you will, you will see a security check first. You just have to click uh, click on uh, this verify button over here and then it will get redirected to your own, own panels. Okay, uh, I'll just check. Is the browser visible now? Okay. I'll just log out and log in again. So this is the website that you will see hisindia.com. It also has download centers, image gallery and everything. You can use it for, uh, for everything related to the surveillance. So uh, in order to access the application, you have to click on this button, application login button, the second button on the banner. When you click here, you will be redirected to the login page and the login credentials will be shared with you for your hospital by the AIMS team. When you enter the credentials, Uh, someone just wrote on the chat that the screen is still not visible. Okay, so, uh, so you enter the credentials and then you click on login. So when you log in. This is the first screen that you will see. This will have list of all the case report forms that have been submitted by, by uh, your hospital, by the data entry operator of your own uh, of your hospital. Okay. In order to enter a new case report form, what you have to do is you have to click on this green button at the top. 
report new case. So when you click on this, you will first see four fields. You have to enter the surveillance unit for which you are entering the form. So I'll select the first ICU here. Then you select the case type, whether it's a BSI or a UTI. Then you enter patient's name. I'll just enter my name over here. And then you enter uh, the medical record number. Now this medical record number is unique for every patient. And this is the number that is used to link a multiple case report forms. For example, if uh, you enter five different cases for this particular patient, then it, it will automatically link all the cases and you can use it for future reference. You can refer cross refer the old forms as well. So this is very important and the patient's name and medical record number is not visible to the AIMS team. So it's, it remains completely confidential. I'll enter the case uh, medical record number and this can be uh, this can be alphanumeric. I'll proceed to the. Okay, now you enter the uh, all the fields. Now this is the exact replica of your physical copy of the case report form. Well, only one field is changed and I'll get to that later. So you enter patient's name, it already picks up from there. It enters your, picks up your hospital name. Then you can either enter patient's date of birth. If you don't know the date of birth, you can enter patient's age. Then uh, if you don't know, you can just click on this age or DOB unknown. Then you have to enter date of hospital admission. So in this case, I'll just put, uh, I'll just put 12th May. Then you have to enter date of uh, admission in the surveillance unit. These are the same fields that you have already seen. So I'll just put 14th. Is this a COVID patient? This field was added after COVID. Whether it's a recognized path pathogen or not. Then uh, you can enter central line details. If you select no, the further field automatically disappear. If you click on yes, you can enter further data. Then after that, you select the outcome. So there are two types of outcomes. We'll also come uh, discuss outcomes in detail uh, at the uh, during later stage of the uh, of the presentation. But first, you have to enter 14 outcomes. So all the fields with star are required fields. So you have to enter uh, all these fields. Otherwise, it won't allow you to submit the form. So uh, you enter uh, enter the 14 day outcome. I I'll just put trans uh, still in surveillance unit. And then, uh, so till now it was the exact replica, only the section five, this is little different from the physical copy. So here, uh, what you do is you enter the sample collection date. So th this is mainly to uh, enter the organism and the drugs you tested it with. So uh, I'll put the date as 15th, 15th May, and then you, uh, you put the organism's name. I'll put E. coli here. And when you put the organism's name, you have to click on load panel. So this will automatically load all the antibiotics linked to this particular organism. And if you hover on the antibiotics name, you can see full name of the antibiotic just for reference. Now you uh, select the susceptibility test result, whether it's a uh, sensitive, intermittent, uh, resistant, or N is for not tested. So I'll just put S, R, and some I'll keep on N only. And this one as uh, I'll just put as uh, sensitive here. Now, if you want to add one more organism, you can do that by clicking on this add organism button. It works the same way. And if you have accidentally clicked on this button, you can just click on remove. If you want to add some comments for future reference or for the PIs, you can just add comment here. I'll just put, uh, put it like that. I'll just put it like a test comment here so we can check it later. as well. So now we click on submit. So now when we submit, uh, so th this, uh, this was a required field and I left it by mistake. So, uh, it automatically asks you that you need to enter it. So uh, we have to enter the date of admission, which needs to be at least two days after the date of admission in, uh, in the, in the surveillance unit. So it's, it's not, I tried to enter 12th May, but it's not allowing me because that uh, it's not two days after the date of admission in the surveillance unit. So all validations are there. So date of admission was 14th May. So I need to enter at least 16th or it won't allow me to submit the form. So I've entered 16th now. After that, I enter this date and then we submit. 
Now, if uh, we are missing some field, it would automatically uh, we'll get an alert. Otherwise, the form will get submitted. Once the form is submitted, you will see a unique case ID on the screen. So now this is uh, this is uh, unique to your hospital. So 37.1 uh, is uh, linked to your hospital's code. So 37 is your hospital ID. One is the ICU ID, the surveillance units ID. So we selected ICU one, which was medical ICU here. So it shows us 37.1. And this is the counter which auto increments after submission of each case report form. And this is unique to every patient, every case. And BSI is uh, obviously because you selected case type as BSI initially. So this is the case ID. So what you have to do if you are, uh, if you're still managing a physical copy of the case report forms, what you have to do is you have to note down this case ID and uh, just write it on the physical copy in case you send it to the AIMS team for cross verification. So you have to write this case ID and when you do that, uh, just strike out patient's name and medical record number uh, so that it's completely confidential because the form submitted in the software doesn't reach the AIMS team. Uh, the name and the medical record number, they don't reach the AIMS team. So I'll summarize this part. You click on the report new case button, you submit the form. Once you submit, a unique case ID appears, which you have to note down on the physical copy of the case report form and uh, it's submitted. So this is how we submit a case report form in the uh, from the data entry operator DEO's panel. I'll also show how it appears in the PIS panel once it's submitted uh, proceeding. So after case report form, so till now we have uh, learned the types of users and how the data flows between them. So the first one was uh, data goes from the data entry operator submits the form, it reaches the PI, PI can either dis disapprove it or approve it. They, once they approve, it reaches the AMC. After that, we have learned uh, how to enter a case report form. And after that, now we will learn how to enter denominated data. So it's a really very, very much similar to how you enter a case report form. So what you have to do is, so there's a navigation on the left side of the screen. The first one was submitted forms. The second is ICU denominator. So you have to click on this button. And when you click on this, this is the screen that you will see. And similar to entering the case report form, there's a green button uh, at the top here as well, which shows enter denominator data. So when you click on this, you will see a simple five, five fields form only. So what you have to do, so this is also a little different from uh, how the, how the physical copy is kept. So in physical copy, you enter the denominator data every day, day one, day two, day three, like that. What you have to do here is you just have to enter the monthly average. You have to select the month, then you select the year, then you enter the surveillance unit, and then you enter patient days, central line days, and urinary catheter days. I'll quickly demonstrate this as well. So this is the data entry operators panel. We click on ICU denominator on the left. So when you click on that, you will see all the previous data over here. And uh, then uh, I'll just put uh, enter, click on enter denominator data. I'll select the month. Let's say I want to enter the data for April right now. And for first ICU, you can select ICU from here. And then you enter the patient days. I'll put 55 here central line days and uh, urinary catheter days. Uh, I'll put it as 10, 55, 25, and 10. When you submit it, uh, it's submitted to the BI and then you can see it over here. You can also edit the fields by just clicking on the, uh, on the month link over here, this blue link. Uh, and uh, so, so these are the two features that a data entry operator primarily can do. They can either submit a new case report form, which we already discussed. They click on the, once they log in, I'll quickly show that screen as well. So, so the data entry operators panel is complete. So this is the first screen that a data entry operator sees. So this is the form that we just filled. And here's the link. So until the uh, PI has approved it or disapproved it, they can still edit or delete it. So this is uh, in order to edit, say, let's say the data entry operator later realizes that they have entered something incorrect. So they can just click on this link 
and edit the form. And this can only be done until the PI approves the form. So if they want to change anything, they can change organism, date of sample collection, and everything like that. It automatically codes to the different colors that you select sensitive as green, resistant as R, like that. So if you want, you can edit the form and submit. What you cannot change here is the case ID because that's unique to every case. So uh, now we have learned how to enter a uh, case report form and denominator data uh, in the in the CRF. Does anyone have any question till here? We will go to the PIS panel after this. All right, so I'll proceed to the PIS panel now. So it's really similar to what we have just done. So uh, we already discussed and uh, I'll quickly summarize in case someone missed it. Uh, so this is how the data flows. Data entry operator submits the data. They submit the CRF and the denominator data. Once they submit it, reaches the principal investigators panel. It reaches the principal investigators panel. Now the PI can either send it back to the DEO or approve. Once they approve, it reaches the AIMS team. Now the AIMS team can, uh, if they feel everything is all right, it will automatically reflect in the analytics, which you can also see for your own host hospital and AIMS team can see for uh, Pan India. And if the AIMS team feels that there is something that needs to be changed, yeah, they can send it back to the PI and then PI can either add their comment or send it back to the data entry operator. So we have uh, we have already learned how the data entry operator panel works. Now we will learn how the PIs panel work. So PI mainly have uh, two features, either to approve or disapprove the forms and add their comments. It works the same way. So uh, it's the same website, hisindia.com. You have to click on the application login, but uh, your particular, your user role will be PI. So the credentials that are provided to you by the AIMS team. When you log in, you will automatically be redirected to the uh, principal investigators panel, which will show a list of all the forms that are submitted. So this is the screen you will see. This is how the navigation looks like. The left navigation. I I'll demonstrate this as well. You can just have a quick look on the uh, on the uh, navigation. So when you click on submitted forms, you will see list of all the forms like this. This is the uh, this is the submitted form screen that the PI sees. So they will have a list of all the forms, and you can see this yellow badge over here. So it's uh, awaiting approval. So you can uh, you can just click on the form, view quickly, view all the review all the details, and approve it. And uh, sometimes when the AIMS team uh, requests a review, it shows as a red review button as well on the right, which you can see right now. And then you can request a review, and you can see the comments and uh, update get the form updated accordingly. So uh, at the top, you will see a list of all the forms that have been submitted for your hospital, but uh, uh, at the top, you will only see the forms that require an action from your side. And primarily there are only two actions, either to approve a form or review a request from the AIMS team. And on the top left, you can also see a drop down filter. So currently when we click on this awaiting approval, you will only, you will only, uh, only see the particular status of the Forms. If you click on awaiting approval, you'll only see awaiting approval forms. If you click on uh, approved, you will see those forms only. And uh, when you click on the case ID, this is PIS panel only. They will see the form. So if you note this uh, Kunal margin one two three four five six, everything is disabled. They cannot edit anything at all. So the PI cannot edit. They can just read, and if they feel that there is something that needs to be changed, they click on this yellow button, which is sent back to DEO, which is the data entry operator. When they when they click on this, it will reach the DEO's panel, and then they can edit it. They will also see a red button, and this form will appear at the top of their panel, and then they can they can change it and submit it again. Now, if the PI feels that everything is all right, they will just click on this green approve button, and once they do that. Do that within one second, it reaches the AIMS panel, and then the AIMS panel can review it. And I'll repeat this part the AIMS team cannot see patient's name and the medical record number. It remains completely confidential, and uh, only your own hospital and the data entry operators can see it. So these are the three types of cases that a PI will see. So you will see a label next to each form submitted. 
So the first case, uh, first status type is awaiting approval, uh, which is self-explanatory. It means that this form is awaiting your approval. You either have to approve it or send it back to the data entry operator. And if you have sent a form to the data entry operator, it shows as a dark gray button sent back to DEO. So if for a lot of time you feel that the data uh, that the data entry operator for, uh, has not updated this form, you can just call them up and tell them that this is still showing as sent back to DEO, kindly update it and send it back. And the third type of case is approved, which is a green button, which will appear at the bottom so that it, it does it because it obviously doesn't require your immediate attention. But still, you can see all the approved forms as well in these in the application. I'll quickly demonstrate this. So uh, when you click on uh, you uh, PI, this is the PI panel that we are going to uh, run right now. So when you visit hisindia.com, it's the same website that you will see. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'll answer your question. So the, the question is when PI sends a, a form back to the DOS, they're provisioned to enter a message. So yes, uh, you you will see uh, you will have to enter a message that what change is required, and the data entry operators and the PIs will be able to see the message, the comment that has been added either by the AIMS team or the PIs team. I, I'll just demonstrate that part. I'm coming to that part. It's really easy. So when you click on the application login on the website, this is the login screen that you see. You enter your PIs credentials here. You click on the login button. Again, there's a security check. Once you submit, it proceeds and this is the first screen you will see. You will see a quick dashboard with the pie charts and all, but uh, the important part over here right now is submitted forms. Rest, all the reporting part is self-explanatory. You will be able to understand yourself. So I'll go to the submitted forms part. This, uh, this left on the left navigation, there's a link called submitted forms. And over here, you will see a count as well. Right now, it shows 65 in the red circle, which means there are 65 actions pending. And action spending, uh, as we discussed earlier, will be in two forms only. Either you have to, uh, either you have to approve the forms, or, or the AIMS team has sent it back, and you need to review. So it, it's the total count is 65. Let's say there are 60 forms that require your approval, and five forms uh, require a review that has been sent by the AIMS team. So the total count will be shown as 65. So in the left navigation, you just click on the submitted forms button. So when you click here, you will see list of all the forms and the latest updated form submitted forms will appear at the top. So this is the form that we just entered. It's the same case ID 52.bsi37.1 that we discussed my, with my name on it, with my medical record number, and it shows the status as appreciating approval. So what we did till now, the data entry operator submitted this particular form and the PI is able to see it on real time basis once they submit and it shows the uh, status as awaiting approval. So now if the, uh, I'll just quickly demonstrate the filter as well. If the PI wants to filter the data, they can just click over here on the left and they can select uh, if they want to see all the CRFs they can, if they want to see only awaiting approval or the approved ones, they can do that as well. So now what they, what the PI has to do, they have to click on this case ID link on the left. They cannot just approve it right away. They have to open the form, check it, and then only they can approve. So when they click on the case ID, this case report uh, report form will appear with the case ID at the top. And here's the button, approve and send back to the DEO. This is what they need to do. So they have to open the form. They need to review everything. So everything has been replicated. They cannot change it. If you see, there's a red cross button over here. They cannot change anything. But it's the same form that was submitted with the same organism E. coli over here with the same test results, same colors for the susceptibility test. And when they submit it, the same comment is also appearing over here. Test comment that we added, if you remember. So uh, now uh, the, the status is showing as awaiting approval. So there are buttons at the bottom as well. In case you scroll down, you check everything or uh, you can see over here at the top as well. The status is awaiting approval now. Either you can approve it 
when you approve it, it reaches the AIMS team. <clears throat> But that, that's easy, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, what you have to do over here, uh, what I'll just demonstrate is, you send it back to the DEO. So what the question was also that whether we can add a comment over here or not. So when the PI clicks on send back to DEO, this is the comment that they need to add and they cannot just send the form back unless they add a comment. If you click on submit, it asks, please provide a comment. Because otherwise the DEO won't know what needs to be changed and what not. So they add, uh, so I, I'll just change, uh, I'll just add change central line site, please. So this is the comment that the PI is sending. We'll also see how this comment is viewed in the data entry operators panel. So when they click on submit, the form is sent back to the DEO. And see, if you see the status is shown as sent back to the DEO over here. And uh, if we go back to the submitted forms, I'll just quickly show how it looks over there. So if you see, now we see a green but a gray button over here, sent back to the DEO. And if you feel, uh, you want to see your own comment, what was the comment that you sent earlier? You just click, click over here and you will see your email ID at the top, exact timestamp at uh, what time. So it was 12, 18 PM, 31st May, Wednesday. And then you are able to see the comment for this particular form. Similarly, there's one more form and there are eight different case IDs linked to this particular form because the medical record number is one, two, three, four, five, six. So while testing, a lot of people must have entered that. So, uh, what I'll do now is I'll go back to the data entry operators panel and show how this particular form that we have requested a review for looks over there. So, uh, I'll go back to the data entry operators panel. So this, uh, this is the data entry operators panel. They click on the submitted forms. So, uh, as we discussed earlier, this is the 1st screen that they will see. So, this is the screen that data entry operators see. Now, if you see, there's a red badge over here review requested, and this will always appear at the top. So whether a review is requested by the AIMS team or the PI, you will see a red batch over here. And when you click on this, you will be able to see the uh, comment associated with it. Change central light, the central line site, please. And if you want, you can just uh, click on this button history, and you can also view this at what time this was submitted. So now what I'll do is what the data entry operator actually needs to do here is they need to open the form. They need to update as, as asked by the PI. So we will change the central line site over here. It was no earlier. I'll put yes. And I'll just select a few options. I'll, I'll put uh, select this as well. Now, when we submit, this will get updated. And when, when the uh, data entry operator now submits, they have to enter a comment, which is again, a required field. So they enter done uh, done and then click on submit now when they submit again status goes back to awaiting approval and if you uh, i'll just let it get submitted this will take two seconds yeah so it's submitted now again if you look at this is data entry operators panel only now if you see there's no red batch because it has been updated so the task here is done and earlier, this count was also 36. Now it's 35. So it automatically decreases. Now, if the data entry operator also wants to see the chat history associated with it, they just click on this button and they will be able to see change central line site, please. And then done. Now, <clears throat> what uh, uh, I'll just refresh the PIS panel and show how it shows over here. Now, the status again changes to awaiting approval. See, the gray badge has disappeared. And now if they feel, uh, if they feel that everything is all right, they, they can, by the way, they can still request a review and send one more comment. No, no, this is not all right. You need to change this as well. If they do that, it will again reach back to the data entry operates test panel and then they can update it. But if they feel that everything has been done, if you see these two fields have been added, we added central line sites just now. So it's updated. Everything else is the same. The comment is still there. And now if they want, they can just click on the approve button and for PI, the comment by sending to the AIMS team, it's optional. So if they want, they can uh, add a comment. Otherwise they can just approve, uh, approve it. If they want, they can just send it 
uh, we changed central line site later. They can add this comment. When they click on approve, it reaches the AIMS team and the AIMS team can see all the comments associated with this form. And now if you see, the status is changed to approved. If we go back to the submitted forms, so now I'll just refresh it. So th this uh, will be updated in a while. Uh, it will change to uh, approved and then you will be able to see this form uh, after all the awaiting approvals forms. Proceeding further, so uh, so we, we have already learned how the PI approves or disapproves the form. If we refresh it, we'll be able to see all the chat history associated with it and the AIMS team cannot see the patient's name, medical record number, but they can send the form back to you. And again, it will uh, show as a red batch similarly in the PIS panel as well. And if you see, you can see the complete chat history over here for each case uh, ID. Coming back to the presentation, so the demonstration of approval system is also complete. So until now we have learned how the data flows between different users, repeating the same part. There are three types of users. First are the data entry operators who enter the data. When they submit, it reaches the PIS panel. The PI can either send it back to the data entry operator if they feel anything needs to be changed, or they can approve. Once they approve, it reaches the AIMS team, and the AIMS team can either send it back to the PI, and PI can now uh, send it back to the data entry operator, and this is how the data flows. Handling review requests part is also done. This is the count that uh, I earlier mentioned and your goal, the DEO and the PIS goal every day should be to make, take this count to zero because these are the pending actions. So you log into the system every day or every two days. You see whether there are any pending actions in the red circle over here. And if this, this is like a notification. So if you see this, you just update the actions and this will go down to zero. We discuss this as well. If you click on the review requested button, you will be able to see the the uh, the comment over here. And when uh, in order to edit any form, you just click on the case ID link. We have already done that. So we are done with handling review requests as well. Now uh, we are almost uh, we have almost reached the end of the presentation and uh, uh, coming to one part, one interesting part. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, what happens is you don't know the final outcome of the patient. Uh, you just know the 14 day outcome sometime he's still in the, uh, and, but you need to submit the form, right? Uh, so in all the cases, patient is not dead or you have not transferred it to a different hospital or the patient has not discharged yet, but you want to submit the case report form. So what you do here is you just enter the 14 day outcome, but you don't enter the final outcome, which you will be able to do at a later stage. So, uh, uh we just, uh, so in this case also that we submitted. If you see, there's a yellow exclamation mark over here. So this yellow exclamation mark, it implies that the final outcome of this particular patient, this particular case is pending. So if uh, by filling also uh, filling this form as well, we just entered the 14 day outcome. So this can be updated later. So now if you see, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly uh, tell that this, the screen that you are seeing on your screen right now, this screen is the data entry operators panel. So if you see, they are not able to edit this form. So there is no checkbox, no checkbox over here. If you see at the other, on the other forms, there's a checkbox, which you can use to delete or edit. So now the form that has been approved by the PI, this cannot be edited. I'll quickly show the, open this form as show and show as well. So this is the form that have uh, comments associated. Yes, uh, for final outcome, you can wait for years until you update. The software doesn't know that you have updated or not. So you can keep updating the uh, form. So uh, for this particular case, what you do is when you click on this case ID, this is the data entry operators panel. I'll repeat that part. When they do, do that, sometimes occasionally the software checks for security in case some hackers are trying to hack in. So this, these are just the security checks. Sometimes you will see the screen. When you click on the checkbox, it knows that you are a human. You are not a bot. You're not trying to hack the system. I'll just, uh, just, just give me a minute, please. I'll quickly log in again. So if, once it's approved, you will see a, a proceeding screen. I'll quickly log in again to the data entry operators panel.
So this is the data entry operators panel. So what I was demonstrating was, uh, so the data entry operator cannot edit the form or delete the form once it's submitted. When we click on this, so if you see this form has been approved by the unit admin, you will be able to edit this form if the admin requests a review. This is the message that you will see, but there's one thing that you can still do because this form, if you remember, it showed a yellow exclamation mark. This one, this yellow exclamation mark will be seen, seen uh, will be shown to all the forms that are pending for the final outcome. If you see, uh, so how you update it, you just click on this update final outcome button. When you click on it, you will see the dialog box with select the outcome. And then when you click with the date, it will update the final outcome. So I, I'll quickly demonstrate this part as well. So you click on the update final outcome for this patient. You click on discharged and then you need to enter the date of discharge as well. I'll put uh, yesterday's date only 30th May and then I click on update. Once this form is updated, the yellow, so if you see the uh, yellow uh, outcome, pend pending outcome button is disappeared. And if you go back to the submitted forms part, you won't see a yellow exclamation uh, mark over there anymore because you have already done the pending task over there. So if you see this particular form, it doesn't have the yellow exclamation mark now. So it means that you have, it means that you have uh, uh, updated the final outcome and you can see the chat, the full chat anytime, whenever you want, along with the timestamps. So this was updated at 1222. It's still there. You cannot edit as discussed. And uh, so the, the updated uh, updating outcome part is done quickly, just 30 seconds for the deleting in case the data entry operator submits a form by mistake. They, they can delete the form simply by clicking on the checkbox. So on the left side, you will see a checkbox next to each form. If you click on that, there's a delete button that will appear on the top right. And if you do that, if you click on that, it will ask for a confirmation and then you can delete the case report form as well. I'll demonstrate that. So, uh, but, but for the cases that have already been approved by the PI, you won't see this checkbox. So if I want to delete this particular case, I click on the checkbox. If I go to the top, I'll see a delete button. I'll click on delete. It will ask, ask for a confirmation. I'll click on okay. Checkbox and exclamation. So exclamation uh, mark means the out final outcome of this particular case is pending. So wherever you see the final uh, yellow exclamation mark, it means you need to update the final outcome of this patient. But now we are understanding how to delete a case report form. Sometimes it happens uh, the data entry operator has submitted a form, but they have entered an incorrect form or they didn't want to enter it at all or they were just testing out something. So in that case, they would want to delete the form. So this is the checkbox on the left, on the left side of the uh, case ID. I'll show this in the presentation as well. So step one, you have to click on this checkbox and step two, you have to click on the delete button. It will ask for a confirmation and then you can delete the case report form. I'll quickly delete one more form over here. This case ID 48. I'll click on the checkbox. I will go to the top. I will click on delete. It will ask for a confirmation and it's obviously it's a permanent deletion. If we click on uh, OK, it will automatically get deleted. But it can, I'll repeat because this is very important. You can only delete the form until the PI has approved it. Once the PI has approved it, you, you won't be. No, no. So uh, I, there, there's a question that if the uh, exclamation and the checkbox are related, I'll answer it right away. So exclamation mark and checkbox are not related. They can appear in the same form as well because the final outcome is still pending. So they are, they are mutually exclusive to each other. Uh, if you look at this particular form, the case ID 14, case ID 14. So the final outcome is pending. That's why you will, you are seeing the yellow exclamation mark, but if it is approved by the PI, if the form is approved by the PI before the final outcome, then the checkbox will disappear. So these are the two examples for your particular question over here. I'll zoom my screen. So case ID 14. In this case ID 14, you see a checkbox. So the checkbox here means it's not yet approved by the PI. That's why you can select it and delete it. But in case ID 28, there's no checkbox. This means that the PI has already approved it. 
so uh, if the pi has approved it you cannot obviously you cannot delete it so there's that's why the checkbox is not there and this uh, exclamation is showing in both the uh, exclamation mark is showing in both the form which means that the final outcome is pending so there are two types of outcome if you refer the case report form one is the 14 day outcome which you have to enter while submitting the form and one is the final outcome which you can update either at that time while submitting the form or at a later stage any time so you can also update it after an year the software allows that but i don't know what the protocol here is till when you have to update but until uh, till you see this it means the outcome is pending final outcome is pending and you need to update it so i'll proceed so this was the last part and uh, coming to the last part so finally coming to the reports so reports are not visible to data entry operators the hospital particular hospital reports the uh, the uh, the rates and all the organism distribution amr patterns everything all the pie charts and everything are just uh, visible to the principal investigators only so th there are many fields associated with that but the simple ones are when you click on the bsi reports button you will be able to see central line days patient days for that particular month and uh, you can also export the raw data the the excel uh, all your hospital's data in excel format if you click on this raw data button at the bottom when you click on that it will uh, it will just take 2 to 3 hours to get generated if you have a lot if you have lots of data and you can also select the date range uh, to do that for which date you want to export and this is how the uh, raw data looks like it has everything for your own hospital and you can analyze you can run your own analysis for this particular data so uh, this is how the uh, so the, the the screen that uh, that is being shown over, uh, on my screen right now is the pis panel so these are all the types of reports that you can see i'll quickly run through mo most important reports so if you go to bsi reports i'll just, just quickly go to that page so you you can see month wise data club c rate device utilization rate uh, total bsi rate number of secondary cases number of non club c cases total central line days this is month wise data this is the test account so it only shows few months of data and it automatically calculates the rates as well so if you play around you will understand everything is self explanatory you will also see be able to see line graphs over here and data for all your icus separately you can also export this for neonatal ICUs. It shows weight wise distribution, uh, uh, things like that. It's all self explanatory. And for the rest, you can reach out to the AIMS team. You can uh, export all the data and a uh, few, a couple of more important features related to reports. So this is how you see the BSI reports and the UTI reports. You can see list of submitted forms. And uh, if you want to see organism distribution, you click on this, you will see list of all the organisms that have been entered for your own hospital. There are filters at the top. If you want to see only see organisms selected that were entered for BSI or UTI, you can just click on these filters at the top. And if you click on the organism, uh, I'll click on this organism, you will be able to see AMR patterns as well. And uh, so this is for this particular organism. You can see list of all the antibiotics that were entered with this one and the ratio over here, there was one sensitive, and one resistant. So this is how the distribution is. It's, it's all self explanatory. It calculates everything for you. But once again, if you want to do your run your own calculations, you can just export the raw data from here and uh, everything will be done. If you click on this, uh, I'll show how it looks like. You just have to click on new request. This is uh, I'm demonstrating how to run the raw data. You just select the date range over here. You select the case type. You select uh, enter your email address, you get the email and then you can also download the form, the, uh, the training data, the uh, raw data from this particular uh, panel. So th this is all for uh, HI and uh, just a couple of more slides I'll show. So this is how the. Uh, the your main HAI hospital acquired infection surveillance for uh, club C and UTI for BSI and UTI works, but it's uh, the software works similarly for SSI as well. So uh, I've added just uh, just quick screenshots for that because it works exactly the same way. It looks the same. There are only few features different. You will get your own credentials, your own URL from the AIMS team. They will uh, guide you how to use it. But I'll quickly show some 
screenshots. So this is the uh, first screen for data entry operators panel in the SSI software. It works the same way. It shows a case ID, event date, patient's name. And uh, when you click on the report new case at the top, it works the same way. You see the case report form and it looks like this. You enter everything, patient's name, everything related to your, it's the exact replica for, uh, again, it's the exact replica of your physical copy of the case report form. If you uh, submit the form, uh, so uh, you enter all the details. Now, the only thing that runs different over here is it has a new feature called follow-ups as well. So it uh, allows you to enter follow-up data. Uh, if wound was reopened, yes or no, everything related to yes or no. So you have to enter the follow-up data on day three, hospital discharge and day 30. And for example, if you haven't entered any data uh, till 30th day or the third day, it will give you a reminder similar to how outcome reminder was there. You will see a notification that the outcome uh, that the follow-up is pending. Just click on that and then you can simply uh, update the follow-up status of this case report form. It, it's really similar. Everything is self-explanatory. If you know how to use HIS software, you will know how to use the SSI software as well. It uh, And uh, the cases that are classified as SSI, you will see a gray badge on the left, the one that you see through arrow. So the, the it has an auto classification algorithm. You just enter the form and you don't need to worry about whether it's a S an SSI or not. The system will automatically tell you based on the follow-up answers that you put, it will automatically tell you whether it's uh, an SSI or not. So you will see this gray badge next to the case ID, whether it's an SSI or not. Once again, coming back, uh, this is how the data flows between users in the uh, SSI software as well and in all the softwares that you are using for surveillance uh, that are developed by us. So the data entry operator enters the data, it reaches the PIs panel, PI can either send it back to the DEO or they can approve it and send it to the AIMS team. The, if the AIMS team wants, they can send it back to the PI and the PI can send it back to the data entry operator. So this is all we have covered almost everything. Thank you so much. And if uh, anyone has any questions, please, uh, Please put it in the chat box and I'll try to answer. I'm just trying to open the chat box. Sorry, just give me a minute, please. Uh, any any questions specific to the web application, uh, particularly to this application? I, I would like to answer those. So I believe there are no questions specific to the uh, how to use the application. There are some questions specific to uh, to registration. So uh, I'll sign off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pranav. I think. Uh... You were so self-explanatory that there are hardly any questions. Uh, always very nice to hear you. And Dr. Pranav, uh, his company is the one which made the software. And I must say for the last six years, the network has been using the software. Uh, and uh, I don't find any site which finds challenges with data entry in the software. So it's very user-friendly and it helps. Uh, the sites themselves to see their own data over time to establish their own benchmark to see how their rates are going up and down and it's uh, very very user friendly and helps us regarding uh, some of the questions about how um, how and when we can start using that we'll be discussing with uh, the nhsrc regarding the district hospitals and um, of course, uh, regarding the sites which are already enrolled, they're already using this software, so there is not an issue with them. But regarding new sites, uh, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, on 29, Dr. Rasna took the IFCAF baseline tool and I had a discussion with the NHSRC team. So we would like all the sites to fill an IFCAF tool first. And we'll assess, this is for the new sites, and we'll assess the baseline capacities. Uh, and then we'll decide that, you know, which site can be further trained. And uh, probably it will be good that you identify the new sites to identify 
you know, one ICU to, we've always, you know, since yesterday we are saying that start slow because this is not uh, something that can be done in a month or two. It takes time to understand. Uh, it takes time to establish the protocol, to establish a team where you have no, no team uh, at all. For hospitals who have a running infection control team and infection control committee, this won't be very difficult. Uh, the only thing is you need to have systems in place and uh, get things done um, maybe in a month or two. And then uh, we kind of assess your baseline capacity. And then, then uh, we ask you to do surveillance for maybe one or two months. Send us the field case report forms and the denominator forms. And if we are satisfied with the way you are doing things, then we give access to the uh, database. And then, of course, uh, the things don't stop there. We keep on um, regularly checking the data. Uh, each month's data is checked and we do uh, site visits to ensure that things are being done as per protocol. And I must say, even, uh, you know, we are all doing HAI surveillance, but still um, we falter and we find sites that, uh, you know, have tweak, sometimes tweak the definitions or are not following the protocol. So we strongly encourage and we advise that at least for the surveillance network, please stick to these protocols because only then our data will be uh, you know, reproducible and representative. So uh, this last session was on data flow, but the data flow has been discussed by, by Pranav and with all the previous speakers. So um, the workflow actually will be decided uh, in our subsequent meeting because there are a number of hospitals from um, various different cadres, uh, the existing sites of the network, uh, a couple of new All India Institute of Medical Sciences, new hospitals who have voluntarily joined uh, this workshop and want to join this network, and of course, uh, the district hospitals through NHSRC. So we will discuss with NHSRC on how to. Um, you know, start uh, in a few district hospitals. So, uh, we what I would want to say is that uh, as a follow up, as the immediate follow up for new sites and for the district hospitals, we will be mailing you five uh, uh, case scenarios along with the case report forms and the worksheets, the worksheets which I've been showing for BSI and UTI. And we would want all of you to individually go through those case scenarios and fill the case report forms and the worksheets and send them to us. So when we receive them, um, we'll go through them and then we will issue all of you a certificate um, through email. So please ensure that uh, we have the list of participants through the NHSRC. So we will give certificates individually, but kindly ensure that you fill those case reports, forms, and the worksheet as per the protocol we have just uh, given you. And we will also, all these PowerPoints will be uploaded on the HAIS website. The NHSRC has also recorded th these two days proceedings and they will be giving us the recorded videos and we will be putting the link of that recorded uh, session on, on the HAIS website. So that will be available on the YouTube channel of NHSRC. So you can also go back and see the recorded videos and record it and you have, you'll have the access to the PowerPoint, which we'll be uploading on the HAIS website. So, and the SOPs are also available on the HAIS website. So please fill those five case scenarios and um, send us to, send, send those field case scenarios to us and we'll give you the certificates for that. Uh, from my side, uh, there is nothing more that is about the workflow. Uh, that is how we do things. We have been doing things for the last 15 years. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Deepika or Dr. Ranjit from NHSRC to give the closing comments from their side. Thank you, 
Shivam. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I really thanks uh, uh, AIMS team, ICMR, CDC for giving so uh, so much of the lucid presentation. And uh, um, I hope the, it will be uh, too beneficial for everyone who is working in uh, specifically in the district hospital. So as ma'am has mentioned that we are working on uh, this with uh, AIMS ICMR team and uh, very soon we are coming up with a complete structured program for uh, the um, IC, uh, ICP as well as AMR. So uh, as Mav has said that all the resource material, etc., is available in HAI website as well as QPS website of the NHRC, the links, etc., we have shared. And uh, like uh, whosoever has uh, registered with us through uh, their states, etc., we are going to share the all links, people and every link through the email also uh, by uh, uh, maximum by uh, tomorrow evening. So uh, once again, I'll thanks, uh, uh, my special thanks to Dr. Purva to you know, take up this particular initiative and uh, uh, and ma'am, we are really looking forward for, you know, taking it to the next level. And uh, of course, uh, my special thanks to uh, all the speakers uh, who has take out the time for providing such a, a nice uh, presentations. So thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Over to you. Before that, you're on mute, I think. Oh, so sorry, I was on mute. So um, I really want to thank you, Deepika. Uh, many thanks to the NHSRC, uh, to Dr. J.N. Shivastav, uh, entire team of NHSRC, uh, Mr. Ranjit, and everyone at NHSRC. We actually met uh, probably six months back, but we have been contemplating about how to reach to the district hospital level because we thought that we have built a network, but this is really incomplete without the participation of medical colleges uh, and the district hospital. So uh, medical colleges, I'm very thankful to Dr. Lata and the NCDC team that they are slightly, uh, slowly, you know, training the medical colleges and incorporating uh, the medical colleges in a staged manner in a network. District hospital was something which were, we were really keen on because that is a very huge chunk and a very important um, healthcare arena where uh, patient care is being given. And we thought that unless we reach out to that level in any form, whether it is uh, surveillance of surgical site infection in cesarean section or just simple bloodstream infection, anything uh, to you know, start gathering data on and build systems upon. So I'm really very thankful for NHSRC for having given us this opportunity for training and uh, as Dr. Deepika mentioned, there were many, many more district hospitals who were keen, but they had to truncate the invitation. So uh, we can have a repeat workshop uh, somewhere in July if uh, there is a request, if there is a need uh, from uh, another set of district hospitals. And we will uh, have a follow up meeting with you and your team on how to, you know, uh, start this. But uh, I hope, Dr. Deepika, it is okay that uh, they will first fill up the IFTAF form, uh, like we discussed yesterday, uh, Dr. Deepika. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. So uh, yeah. this IFTAF form will be sent to all of you, and um, uh, the NHSRC requires that you fill the IFTAF form so that they will analyze your baseline capacities uh, based on your responses, and then. Uh, also, they have the background information about your baseline capacities, and then uh, we will soon get back to you on you know how we can start in a very stepwise manner. To so just uh, to give a brief uh, history about how we started, we have, I told you we started with five hospitals, and we only started with central line associated bloodstream infection. So that is how we started small, one ICU in each hospital, only collapses, and then we escalated, and we are here today with so many hospitals. So 
for each of you who have joined who intend to join this network i we say that we we'll advise that you start slow start small develop your systems and team and follow the protocol so it's important that even if you do it in one ICU, icu you do it properly rather than taking 10 icus and just things going haywire it will be good that you build up your system because a system is something which will be sustainable uh, just taking everything uh, at a time will not be sustainable for you. So I think that is all from my side. I really want to thank the CDC team who has uh, who has had this uh, vision and uh, the confidence uh, in aims that uh, we could start this work uh, from 2014, actually not 2015. For the last seven years, we are receiving uh, support from CDC. Uh, financial as well as technical support uh, uh, on how to really establish a network. So we we are supported through the huge expertise of CDC, not only the country office, but also the Atlanta team. So there is a huge team uh, which is supporting us uh, from Atlanta and we are very privileged that uh, we are being supported directly by the CDC. So thank you all at CDC. Uh, I would really like to thank the ICMR team, Dr. Kamini Walia and her entire team, Dr. Lata Kapoor from NCDC and her team uh, and all the medical colleges, all the sites uh, which are part of our network and whom some of the sites whom we look forward to, to being regional mentors now, because as we expand, we need regional mentorship to support the district hospitals and of course, the AIMS administration for, you know, giving us this uh, uh, the free hand support, not only for local implementation, but also for uh, supporting so many other sites. I would also like to thank my entire team at Trauma Center of AIMS, who has been working tirelessly for the last so many years in making things work and in supporting the sites in trainings and, you know, responding to all your queries. So my Special thanks to the entire trauma center AIMS team who has been working on that. And finally, uh, of course, NHSRC for everything, including, you know, arranging this uh, online training at uh, a platform of WebEx that you have done at such a short notice. So I hope I have not missed out anyone. And thank you to all of you who shown such eagerness uh, in participating. And a request to the existing sites who have been part of this network that please uh, work on data quality because we are finding that many sites are not following the protocol. So it's it's a request that please uh, keep these SOPs everywhere with all your project staff and follow the protocols. Otherwise, our data will not be quality assured. So uh, that is all from my side. I just uh, would like to hear from Dan uh, his closing remarks. Dr. Damien. Uh, thanks, Dr. Porvan, and thanks everyone. I really want to appreciate all the work that you've done to kind of lead this. And 100% agree that systems need to be built to take this forward. There's no one person, no matter how good you are, that can do it, but together we can. Um, we're all in it to build a better system for the country, but it does take leadership. It takes leadership from Ames, ICMR, NCDC, from those that are at all the hospitals. And we're here to support in any way we can that leadership and you as individuals to do the best so that you can take care of people. And if there's one thing I know that India has, it's really, really good people from top to bottom and, and you make things work. So, uh, again, we're very happy to be part of this. Very happy for all of the, the systems that have already been built and really want to lean into building even more of those for sustainability. Back to you, Dr. Purvan. Thank you so much, Dan. And a uh, uh, final word from Dr. Wallen. Dr. Wallen is um, the foot soldier from CDC who has been supporting us since the last five years and has been really working towards strengthening of the system. So 
Uh, I would request Dr. Valan to also please say a few words. Dr. Padilla, you have covered all uh, those things. Uh, I really uh, in the last two days, like, you know, maybe I might be listening to you for the 15th or 20th time. And uh, every time, you know, like uh, the, the first time how you started while presenting in back in 2016, with the same enthusiasm, like you present, like even today, you know, maybe if it's like more than 15 times, maybe uh, even we did some sessions for NCDC also. And uh, we are here to support you and whatever we, we could and we will try our level best uh, so that a strong network of healthcare associated infection surveillance is built and, you know, targeted infection prevention control activities are uh, undertaken in India, uh, which will really improve the quality of care uh, across primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary care uh, uh, levels in, in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Valan, uh, and uh, I hope that the next workshop will have more uh, regional trainers who will be taking this workshop. Like you said, it has been almost 15 times, so now I think people might have got bored of me. So um, I would be very happy if we have younger people who have been working on this in the last so many years with me to take a couple of sessions. So thank you so much, all of you, and we'll get back to you with the follow-ups and with certificates and. Uh, rest assured, we won't leave you alone. We will keep on giving you work so that uh, we want the entire country to, you know, slowly come up and come up with Indian data because India owes it big time to generate its own data. You know, we are one fifth of the world population, so we must must we have a lot of onus on ourselves to generate our own data. So thank you so much, and we'll see you. Bye.